Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is the video teaching series, How to Study the Bible, or How to Study the Bible So That You Can Know Jesus. As we taught in the last lesson, Jesus is the Logos made flesh dwelling among us. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ being the Logos uh, who became flesh and Lord being the Spirit of the Father on and in the man Christ Jesus. So in this lesson, uh, this is the culminating lesson of the introductory lessons on the principles of why we should study the Bible, how to study the Bible as far as from the spiritual perspective. Starting with the next lesson, we will get into the more uh, nuts and bolts details of the biblical principles for finding truth. But uh, this final lesson is so critical. Uh, some of these things have been mentioned before, of course, but it, it, it needs to be emphasized. This needs to be emphasized. Jesus said, John 14, 6, again, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. So I need to love the truth. I cannot love Jesus more than I love truth. I cannot love Jesus more than I love truth. The scripture says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You cannot be saved without loving the truth. You can't be. You can't be saved without loving the truth. Loving the truth. Not liking the truth. Not preferring the truth. Not fighting for the truth. But loving the truth the truth, loving it. Love is, love is, what you, is what you give yourself to. I love my wife. I give myself to my wife. I love God. I give myself to God. But I can't love God without loving his word. I can't, and I don't love his word if I don't love truth because he is truth. And the word of God tells us the truth. So again, verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 2 uh, that Antichrist is coming with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, what cause? They receive not a love of the truth. For this cause, when you don't love truth, this is what you open yourself to. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They received not a love for the truth. And receiving not a love for the truth opened them up to a spirit of delusion that came to them because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And he says, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. If I it, it, that spirit of delusion is going to bring a lie to me, but I've had people say, "Well, God has showed me this." Yeah, yeah I don't doubt God showed it to you. God opened the door for a spirit to come and show you that, and now you can't see anything else. You can't see truth anymore because now you believe a lie, and it's a lie. It's a lie. Now, without getting into great detail on this, God is not the one who lied. And when it says, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, there are other places in the Bible that I don't have time to get into on this that clearly give the illustration. One would be Satan coming before the throne of God in the first chapter of Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Okay. Uh, another would be uh, where a lying spirit 
came to the king to get him to go to battle so that he could be killed. It was a lying spirit came to him. Now, God shall send them in the sense that God permits it to happen. He doesn't lie. God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. But when I don't have a love for the truth, he has no basis upon which to protect me from a lie. And when these deceiving spirits want to come, like, like the Lord said, if you consider my servant Job, and Satan says, I, I don't even bother with him. You've got a hedge around him. But if you took that hedge down and let me deal with him, I'd get him to curse you. God said, okay, you can do this and this. You can't do this. Now, uh, Satan did all of that. God didn't do any of it, but he did it with permission. What was the permit? What was the purpose of God allowing that? To test Job, to try Job, to purify Job so he could bring him to the next place. But what if God allows all this to reveal to us that we're believing a lie, but we refuse to see it? Then we're going to be damned because we believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What is the primary purpose that flesh denies truth? Because truth often tells us don't do what you want to do or do what you don't want to do. And so if truth is going to tell me what I don't want to do or tell me to, to not do what I want to do, I don't want to know truth, do I? I want, I want to be able to justify to myself that I have that I have the right to do what I want to do or the right to refuse to do what I want, don't want to do. That's having pleasure in unrighteousness, is doing it my way rather than God's way. But we are bound, verse uh, 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, beloved brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. God didn't predestinate your salvation. Free choice is always there. But God has chosen us because we want truth. He chooses them that choose him. He rejects those that reject him. And the number one test is do you believe truth or do you reject truth? Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are called to obey him. We are called to know the way. We are called to know the truth. We are called to have the life. But the qualification there is truth. That's why the wise man in Proverbs 23, 23 says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Because wisdom, instruction, understanding are all elements of the truth. It is, wis it is truth that brings wisdom. It is truth that gives true instruction. It is truth that gives true understanding. Only truth can give those things. So you buy the truth. There's no price on the truth. You can't, you can't put a price on the truth. Truth is priceless. It's the most valuable commodity, so to speak, there is. Psalms 33, 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. You want to know God? You have to love truth. You don't love truth, you don't love God. You can say you believe in God, but if you don't believe the truth, you don't believe in God. You believe in a lie, and you believe in that lie, and you would be damned because you don't believe the truth. Psalms 43, 3 says, O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacle. Light and truth. You can't separate light and truth because truth is the light. Truth is the light. Psalms 100 and verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Psalms 119, 151 says, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Everything in the word of God is true. Everything. 
It's a true, some of it is a true record of the lies that people told. Some of it is a true record of the sins that people committed. But it's true. Psalms 138 and verse 2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Well, that's an amazing statement because the scripture says, at his name, every knee is going to bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he's exalted his word above his name? Yes. Because the first thing that the I am infinite God did was he became Logos expressed into time, into finite. When God expressed it into the finite, something came into being separate from the infinite God, not separate from his person, but separate from his dimension, infinite, finite. And That expression of the infinite God into the finite is truth. It's truth. And and he has magnified that expression of himself above everything, including his name. In in, In the infinite before time, he's the I am God. There's no record of him having a name. Because why? Because his name reveals himself to man. His name reveals his person to man. His name reveals his works to man. That's why the name Jesus is the the I am God, the self-existent one saves. Jehovah, the I I am, the the four uh, unspeakable tetragrams, Y-H-V-H in the English language, uh, that's not a word you can speak. Now, man added the vowels of the Hebrew word Adonai in there and came up with the word Jehovah. God didn't do that. God didn't do that. He gave his name as YHVH, and it was uh, the representative of the self-existent one, the I Am. And so the name Jesus is the I Am saves. That's why there is no other name given among men in heaven and earth, whereby we must be saved. The I am saves, but the Logos is exalted above even his name. Psalms 145, 18, the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Oh, wait, what's the corollary of that? If I'm calling upon him and I'm not in the truth, he's not near There is one prayer that every person in earth can pray that God will always hear. And that's the prayer of repentance. The prayer of true repentance will always be heard by God. But if I want to live in my sin and I don't want to repent, then he will not hear my prayer. So he is nigh unto all of them that call upon him. Here's the qualification all of them that call upon him in truth. Daniel 10, 21. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there's none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. The the scripture is true. John 1, 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. This is really an amazing verse. The word given thereby means that Moses was the conduit that the law was given through. The law wasn't, didn't originate with Moses. He is not the author of it. Uh, he was only the conduit of it. But the Greek word for came is completely different, completely different concept than given. The law was given by Moses. He was the conduit of truth, but grace and the uh, conduit of the law. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The word come there means to come into existence, to come into manifestation to man by Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is 
full of grace and truth. And he is the manifestation of grace and truth to mankind. Big difference of being the conduit and being the embodiment of. Uh, John 4, 23 and 24, but the hours come and now is when the true worshipers, and he said true worshipers, if there's only worshipers, then the word true is not only extraneous, but it's also an unnecessary, but it's also providing a false narrative. It's false if there's only worshipers. But when the Spirit of the Lord says through Jesus, the true worshipers, he automatically declared the corollary. There are false worshipers. Worshipers, yes, but false worshipers. The hour is coming now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. What is the Father seeking? He's seeking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to have a life of prayer. I want my life to be a life of prayer. But I can't separate my life into prayer, into being a life of prayer separate from the word. There are some of the greatest times of fellowship and prayer I've ever had in my life has been in studying the word with him, with him talking to me, me asking him questions, me giving him thanks and praise for what he's showing me that I did not see and did not figure out on my own. So the Father is seeking those who are seeking him. The Father's seeking for those that are seeking him, but not just seeking him, but seeking him in spirit and truth. Or can I say it this way? Seeking him by means of the spirit and by means of the truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must. It's an absolute necessity. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In the previous lesson, we were talking about tradition. Jesus said, your tradition makes your worship vain. Oh, they were worshipers, but it was rejected worship. It was empty, worthless, useless worship. They saw themselves as worshipers, God did not. Why? Because they were not true worshipers. Why? Because they worshiped him religiously. They did not, by religion, by tradition, they did not worship him by spirit and truth. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is a part of the prayer that Jesus prayed after the three, the, 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 the message he, the lesson he taught to the disciples before his, he went to Gethsemane and, uh, and, was, and prayed and then was taken and crucified. So the, uh, the, the lesson was John 14, 15, 16. In John 17, this is the only recorded prayer session of Jesus. What we call the Lord's Prayer is not the Lord's Prayer at all. He was teaching us how to pray. But John 17 is a recording of Jesus actually praying what he prayed. And a part of that prayer is he prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. And then he made this declaration, thy word is truth. Now, that's an awesome statement. The word is true. The word, thy word is truth. But if you don't have eyes that see, ears that hear, and heart that's able to perceive, receive, believe, then you're not going to see the truth in the Word, no matter how much you read it, no matter, no matter how much you hear it preached. You're not going to see it. Why? Because knowing the truth is as much about the condition of your heart as it is about the ability, ability of your mind to read. Because if my heart is not where it needs to be with God, then the Spirit of God cannot speak to me. Cannot speak to me. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, I read in a previous lesson. 
No, I didn't, not this. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit, with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So this verse is actually talking about salvation as it applies to us here and now in preparation to of the eternal salvation. And so I trusted in him after I heard the word of truth. And what is the word of truth? The gospel of my salvation for a lost soul. That's the word of truth. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that he did for me because I cannot save myself. And after I believed, I, I have to obey the scripture. And of course, we know the scripture also taught repentance of water baptism in Jesus' name. And then he, after you obey the scripture, you believe and you don't have faith if you don't have works that confirm the faith. Uh, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That Holy Spirit of promise is the earnest of our inheritance that we have here and now that assures us we're going to be redeemed, that he's going to redeem this Purchased possession. We are his possession. We're bought with a price. We're not our own. And so he's going to, he's going to, we have been redeemed and he's going to redeem us not only from sin, but off this earth. And that is to the praise of his glory. For the hope, Colossians 1 5 says, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard in the word of truth of the gospel? If you want to have hope of heaven, the only source of it is the word of the gospel. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Contrary to some people's doctrine, it is, ne it is not now or ever will be and never has been the will of God for anybody to be saved. Everybody, it is the will of God for all men to come under the knowledge of the truth and to be saved. All men. That means those that are not saved are not saved by God's, uh, God is not complicit in their, their law, being lost. God is not responsible for them being lost. It's the will of God for all men to be saved. First Peter, uh, second Peter chapter three, verse nine. Uh, it is the will of God for all men to, uh, 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 how does that go? <laughs> uh, it's not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not the will of God. So this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, 1 Timothy 2, 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's the will of God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, the Logos made flesh, there it is right there, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Only the flesh that was robing the Logos could die in our place. God can't die. The Spirit of God can't die. So the only part of the Lord Jesus Christ that could die, died. That was the flesh. But it was the only flesh that God ever had. So the only part of God that could die, which was the flesh of the man Christ Jesus, is what died for us, the mediator, the go-between, the interface between the infinite and the finite, the Logos made flesh. It is the will of God for all men to be saved. James 1, 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So it is the will of God. It was the will of God. It is the will of God. It will be the will of God for us to be saved if we're willing to be born or begat, conceived, begotten by the word of truth. Amen. First Peter 1.22 that I've used in a previous uh, lesson seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with pure heart fervently. You and I cannot purify our hearts through religion, through church membership, through church attendance. 
Now, if you believe the word of God, you're going to gather together with the body of Christ, whatever you call it, worship, service, church, service, gathering, uh, assembly. It doesn't matter what you call it. There's, it's referred to many different ways in the scripture. But I'm going to come together with the body of Christ. I'm going to fellowship with the body of Christ. I'm going to pray with the body of Christ. I'm going to receive teaching and instruction by those that have been appointed to lead the body of Christ, appointed by God to lead the body of Christ. I'm going to do that. But I cannot purify my soul except as I believe the word and obey the truth through the spirit. I can't do it. And then finally, verse that we've used many, many, many times, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man. So again, the purpose of this lesson is that we might know, believe, love the truth. We need to love the truth enough to persistently consistently, and faithfully search for it every day. Every day. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Is that verse important to you? Is that promise important to you? Are you, is that a priority in your life? Are you giving yourself to God by giving yourself to the pursuit of truth? I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that would be the case. This lesson concludes the introductory lessons to the actual teaching of the practical, biblical, spiritual steps for studying the Bible that will begin in the very next lesson, video number 12, lesson number 11. God bless you. I look forward to sharing that with you. In Jesus' name, amen.